guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Koobana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest novella, Ghost in the Box, is now out. If you want a quick jaunt through a creepy ghost story that will keep you guessing until the end, then check it out on Amazon right now. We also have a brand new design up in the Koobana merchandise store. You can check that out at koobana.store. We have shirts, mugs, stickers, masks, and much more, so do check it out and help support the show at the same time. This week, we're taking a look at a variety of stories that are, in the end, quite strange. Sometimes things happen that just can't be explained, and other times, even if you do understand exactly what's going on, it still doesn't make any sense. To start, a young man visits a Japanese inn in the countryside for a small vacation and, that night, gets a lot more than he bargained for. Find out why in Monster Inn. Banquets can be scary, but also fun. The other day, I stayed at a small Japanese inn. It was in an out-of-the-way area with few visitors, so it was quiet, and I liked that. The staff were attentive, the garden beautiful, and the rooms clean. It was a fantastic inn, with no complaints from me. The inn was located in the mountains, so there was nowhere to go out at night. By the time the clock hit midnight, the inn was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. I got into bed early, but sometime around 2am, I woke up. I couldn't get back to sleep, so I decided to explore the quiet inn a little. When I opened the door to my room, the hall was pitch black and all the lights were off. The only light in the cold corridor was the green light from the emergency exit sign. It was strange for an inn to be so dark, so I wondered if they were trying to save money on energy bills or something. It was dumb, but I kind of felt like I was on a test of courage as I walked around the dark inn. Suddenly, I sensed somebody move in front of me, and I squinted in the darkness. In the moonlight coming through the window, I saw one of the older staff members doing something in front of a guest's room. I could hear a small metallic sound, like something rattling, so I thought that maybe he was trying to steal something. I hid and watched him. But he wasn't trying to open the door. He was padlocking it. I'd seen something I shouldn't have, and so I tried to withdraw further into the shadows. When he was done locking the door, the old man started walking towards me. My room was up ahead. He was going to try to lock me in too. My body froze. I had no idea what was going on, but I knew I was in danger. I couldn't let him see me, and so I held my breath. Yet, as the old man walked past, he easily spotted me. He looked down at his watch and sighed in dismay. Well, now you'll just have to come with me, he said. He pulled me to my feet and tried to drag me off somewhere. I tried to run, but then several staff members surrounded me, and one of them pointed something huge at me that looked like a lighter. If you wish to remain safe, then you absolutely mustn't raise your voice, he said. I fell silent and obediently followed them. What else could I do? They took me to a banquet hall. It was the only place in the dark inn that had the lights still on. The hall was full of people that looked like locals and other people from the inn, and there were numerous local dishes on the tables. Everyone seemed to be on standby for the banquet to begin at any moment. They seated me at a random spot, and then a woman in her forties came over to me. You are terribly unlucky, aren't you? But everything will be all right, as long as you stay calm, so do your best, okay? She did her best to cheer me up. Before long, a strong-looking man sat next to me and spoke in a strong tone of voice. When the banquet starts, you must enjoy eating and drinking, like it's the best thing ever. Before long, a new guest will arrive, but 
Don't pay them any mind. If you can't stop yourself, then don't look at them. However, if you do avoid looking, then don't do so unnaturally, and never disrupt the cheerful atmosphere. This guest is someone we must welcome once a year without fail, so you absolutely mustn't do anything rude. Finally, the banquet began. Women carefully served us food and drinks, but I focused all my attention on my chopsticks and picking at the food. On the surface, it seemed that everyone was enjoying themselves, but it was clear that they were all scared as well. As I was berating myself for waking up, suddenly it felt like the temperature in the room dropped. Footsteps slowly approached from the dark hall outside. The people at the party pretended not to notice, and they grew even noisier as they ate and drank. I thought that I would be a danger if I spoke out of turn, so I focused on eating the delicious food and nothing else. Finally, the sound of the footsteps changed. They stepped onto the tatami mats of the banquet hall from the wooden corridor outside. I was focused on the food in front of me when I sensed two legs walk by me. They were black. No, perhaps dark would be a better word to describe them. They were thin, like the legs of a woman or child, but they bore a heavy weight to them. The legs passed the long table, walked past me diagonally, and then sat on some cushions nearby. As I picked at the food on the plates, desperately trying with all my might not to scream, suddenly it was like the oppressive, cold air in the room lifted, and I looked up before I could stop myself. Everyone was smiling, with looks of relief on their faces. It's over, the woman next to me said, and I felt all the tension leave my body. The real banquet began after that, with all the people who had experienced that terrifying event together. We enjoyed the food, which I hadn't actually tasted up until that point, and we drank like old friends after the strange experience we'd all shared together. It seemed the padlocks were collected after that, and it was unlikely that any of the guests even realised they'd been locked in that night. Before I knew it, it was morning, and I returned to my room to sleep. By the time I woke up, the sun was already high in the sky and the inn outside my room had returned to normal as well. I checked out a little later than expected, but everyone at the inn saw me off. You're one of us now, so come back any time. They seemed reluctant to see me go, and I felt sad leaving them as well. We had already become good friends, and I could tell that we had formed strong bonds because of what we experienced together. But even so, I never wanted to go back to that inn ever again. For our next story, we're joining a police officer in Tokyo as he discovers something terrifying that happens not just at his station, but in stations all over Tokyo, and likely the country itself. Find out what in Amemiya-san. I used to be a police officer until a few years ago. As soon as I graduated from university, I started work in T. Shima Ward of Tokyo. Graduates of T. University were called the Career Group. Sorry if it sounds like I'm boasting. So I was a promising star. As such, my senior colleagues treated me very well. So one day, the chief of police invited me out for a drink. I had already gotten changed and was getting ready to go home, but he was still in uniform. I just have to send one more email, so please wait, he said. I sat down at my desk and looked around the room, just waiting to pass the time, when suddenly someone threw a binder down on the desk in front of me. You'll hear about this someday anyway, so you might as well read it while you're waiting, the chief said. Then he returned to his desk and started typing again. It was a plastic binder, about two centimetres thick, and on the spine it said, Amemiya-san. 
What on earth was this? I flicked through the pages. It was full of reports and crime scene photos. So it was a file from a crime scene investigation. When I read the contents, I was astonished. How can I put it? It was a collection of supernatural cases, just like you'd find here. And most of them were unsolved. With each page I turned, a chill ran down my spine. There was a photo of a suspect in a burglary case who was apparently possessed by a kitsune. His expression was no joke. It wasn't a human face. Seriously, it was terrifying. Even the written record of the interview with him just listed stuff like ki ki ki. This wasn't the only thing in there, but seriously, it was too much. I'll just leave it at that. After I read about a third of the binder, the chief took it from me. All right, that's enough. You can read the rest once you become chief, he said, and then he put it back in a locked drawer in his desk. My mind went somewhat blank and there was a gross sweat under my armpits. I asked the chief about it when we arrived at a restaurant in Ikebukuro. In short, it went something like this. The police have a sort of performance report in each jurisdiction. You can think of it as like an arrest rate or something like that. Now, as you no doubt know, the police are a necessary community service, and on top of that, there's no denying that there is a difference between different communities. For example, there are some jurisdictions where, no matter how hard they try, there are numerous cases where matters can't be solved scientifically. There are a few areas like that. And as such, the rate of solved cases in these areas decreases. So, to deal with this lowered rate of solved cases, a rule was established in the 70s to deal with special cases like this. Cases that met special conditions were thus exempt from the performance ratings. And those were all the cases in the amemia sound file. So who is Amemiya-san then? The name on that file, I asked. The chief took a pen out of his chest pocket and wrote a single character on some paper. The character for spirit. You get it. It means up above. Where rain comes from, yeah? He grinned as he said it. A few days later, I grew more curious about that file so I asked the chief to show it to me again. Don't worry yourself about it. Just forget it even exists, he said in a loud, booming voice, and that was that. Further down the line, I ended up having some troubles with that same chief, and so I quit the force. Now, I lead a peaceful existence as a regular office worker. How can I put it? It was kind of like the X-Files. And according to my colleagues, there were similar files in the A and B wards too. All of this seems a bit messy looking over it, but yeah, feel free to think it's fake if you want. In this next story, a freelance writer decides to put together a book on the many vagrants that live in Tokyo, but one of the men he meets claims to come from the future. At first he doesn't believe him, but... It turns out he may have been telling the truth. Find out why in Tensho 24. The story I'm about to tell you now, I heard from Murasan, alias. On this particular day, we were drinking together at his house. Murasan was a freelance social writer. At the time, he had plans to visit various villages and parks to ask vagrants what had happened in their past and how they ended up there, which he then planned to put together into a book. But are they really going to talk to you so easily? I asked him. I have a trick to get them to talk, Murasan said with a smile, resting his chin on a bottle. Apparently, it was as simple as giving them a bottle of sake and some snacks. 
Then, they were more than happy to start talking. According to some of the people he'd already spoken to, one used to manage a small town factory. Another came to Tokyo from a rural farming village to earn some money in winter and ended up staying. And so on and so forth. He'd heard all sorts of stories. Were there any people with interesting histories? I asked. Murasan seemed to stop to think for a moment, and then he quietly lit a cigarette. There's one story that I can't use. The guy was clearly lying, wasn't in his right mind. Having said that, he then put out his cigarette. Well, tell me! I tried to hurry him along by gesturing with my hands. So, this guy said that he came from the future, from the year Tensho 24. What? The future? This isn't back to the future, man. How did he say that he came here then? And Tensho? Is that supposed to be the next era name after Showa? The ridiculousness of it made me laugh before I could stop myself. Looked like it was a difficult story for the usually straight-laced Murasan to tell. Look, hang on. Ah, here it is. Tensho 24. Murasan pulled out a notebook and then showed me the characters for the era name written on the page. After that, my memory went hazy and seemed to cut out. The next thing I remember after that was Murasan telling me about this homeless person. He might have told me the guy's name, but I don't remember it now, as he looked at his notebook. According to him, in his time, we have our first female Prime Minister, and her name is Mori Nanigashi. Wow, we finally get our first female Prime Minister, huh? I said with a cluck of my tongue. Seems he didn't go to school either. He apparently took special classes on a computer at home. Does that mean there are no schools in the future? There's nothing written about it here in my notes. I might have asked him about it, or I might not have. I was only jokingly asking him questions after all. Murasan then turned the page. In the future, there will be large buildings like arcades with roads that cars can drive on, parks, shops, land and everything. Does that mean they have no concept of outside? Does that mean there was a nuclear war or something? No, apparently this is just in crowded cities, but the countryside apparently isn't that well maintained. He turned back to his notes again. Ah, here it is. When he was 15, he found himself here, in our time, in the Oyogi area. That's quite a big time slip, huh? He fell into a wild panic and the police found him and took him in, but he didn't have any ID on him, and they couldn't understand what he was saying either. He snuck out at the first chance he could, and after that, he started living on the fringes, as though in hiding, unsure of what to do. One of the vagrants in the park approached him one day, and... He has now been living there for the last 18 years. Meaning, he's 33 now. He's still quite young then. I can't work because I don't have a family register, he told me. Maybe he pretended to be from the future because he's one of those people who just doesn't want to work these days, huh? And, just like that, Murasan's story was over. I heard that he went to find the man from the future five years after that, but apparently he had been killed by a gang of youths that were hunting homeless people. When I asked Murasan if something had come up that required seeing that man again, he said that something the man told him would happen really did happen. This is going to be a huge scoop, no doubt about it. His eyes were bloodshot. I was so overwhelmed by his presence at the time that I didn't ask him more about it, and I regret that now. You see, after that, Murasan got involved in an incident and was killed, and nobody ever found his notebook. 
Have you ever mistaken a stranger for a friend or family member because of their uncanny resemblance? What if it actually was that person, but also wasn't? Because that's exactly what happens to the woman in this next story. Find out why in Café Tomoko. I was walking alone downtown when I looked into the window of a cafe. There I saw my friend Tomoko sitting alone. I thought I'd call her phone and give her a fright, but she didn't answer. She sat still, her eyes rolling back and forth as she watched the flow of people walking by. I approached the window to knock on it, my phone still in hand, when finally she answered. Hey, I'm in Nani Nani. I saw you so I thought I'd give you a call, I said. But Tomoko said that she was at home, watching TV. I looked again and the Tomoko sitting in the cafe wasn't on her phone. I thought that I must have mistaken her for someone else. But the girl sitting at the cafe had the handmade phone strap and bag that I gave Tomoko for her birthday. And she was wearing clothes that Tomoko often wore. I told her this over the phone and she suddenly got worked up. I'm gonna put those clothes on and come over with that bag, so wait for me, she said. I was starting to feel like whoever was on the phone was pranking me. So, still on the phone, I knocked lightly on the cafe window. The woman looked at me. It really was Tomoko. That had to be the real Tomoko and the person on the other end of the phone had to be the fake. Quit fooling around. Who is this? I asked. Eh? It's Tomoko. Look, I know it's not, so enough already. But I really am at home now. The voice coming from the phone was Tomoko's. I was starting to get confused, and then the Tomoko in the cafe stood up, pointed at me, and... Her face went bright red with anger. Then she grabbed her bag and ran out the door as fast as she could. And so did I. I heard a voice calling my name from behind, but I couldn't turn around. Maybe it was just an accidental resemblance, but that didn't explain how she knew my name, nor how she had the handmade phone strap I gave Tomoko. Even now, that still remains a mystery. In the end, neither Tomoko ran into each other. I ran all the way back to Tomoko's house, half crying, and she was there like she said she was. I ran into the fake Tomoko several times after that. Oh, and because I didn't hang up the phone, the real Tomoko heard her call out my name when I was running as well. Have you ever lost something that was right there in front of you? Sometimes these things return in the strangest places and in the strangest times. And sometimes, those times and places can be dangerous. Find out why in The Bicycle That Disappeared. This happened during the summer holidays of fourth grade. I was playing with my friends at the park near my house and for some reason or another, we started telling ghost stories. As we kept going, we decided that we should visit a haunted house together. There was a spot nearby that was rumoured to be haunted at the time. In reality, it was just a small and shabby prefab building, like the type you find on construction sites. But because we were just elementary school kids, the story got told so much that it was exaggerated and, by that point, it had become something terrifying, like the house in Juon. According to A, who told me the story, it would take us about an hour to get there by bike. And so, we decided to go home first, get everything ready, and then meet up again. I was a bit of a chicken, but I was excited for an adventure. I rushed home, unable to contain my joy. I packed my bag with some snacks, a torch, and even a wooden sword, told my parents I was going out, and then rushed outside. But my bicycle was nowhere to be seen. I had parked it by the front door, and 
I clearly remembered locking it. I looked for it everywhere, but it was gone. I told my mother, but then she just told me off and got angry at me, claiming that I must have forgotten to lock it again. She wouldn't hear me out, because my bicycle had already been stolen twice in the past. In the end, I was the only one not able to go on the haunted house adventure. That evening, I was at home doing homework. My mum made me. When my mother entered my room, her face pale. Three of your friends were hit by a truck. They've been seriously hurt, she said. That night, as rude as it might be to say, I was more worried about getting haunted than I was about my friends, and I was thus unable to sleep. Later, I heard that they were on their way to the haunted house when the accident happened. But apparently, they'd been playing chicken at each pedestrian crossing they came across, and then finally, when one light turned red and they dashed out, they got hit. In the end, it was completely their own fault. All three of them ended up with only minor injuries, and they all recovered after a month or so without any side effects. As for my bike being stolen, my mother said that it must have been our ancestors protecting me. But that's where the problem began. That same winter, as I stepped outside to go to school, suddenly something heavy dropped on my head and knocked me out. According to my parents and the police, my stolen bicycle had apparently dropped right on my head from above. And when I say from above, I mean from above our two-story house. Police checked the roof, but there was no sign that anyone had been up there. In the end, it remained a mystery. I broke my neck and ended up in the hospital for six months thanks to that. If it was a haunting, I don't know why I copped it the worst when I didn't even go. And if it was my ancestors, well, that was just a little cruel, don't you think? When I think about it now, none of it makes any sense at all. The young man in this next story is a diligent student who studies late into the night. But beware, for sometimes you might not always be alone. Find out why in Late Night Radio. This happened 14 or 15 years ago. There was a mountain behind my house and my room on the second floor faced it. A small path leading to the mountain also passed by my room. I was a student at the time, and I listened to the radio on low volume as I studied late into the night. At some point, I realised I could hear another soft sound coming from somewhere else. Curious, I turned the radio down and listened closer. It seemed to be the sound of footsteps coming down the path from the mountain, and what sounded like the voices of several children. There was no way children could be coming down from the mountain this late at night, so I listened again, even closer. But there was definitely the sound of footsteps on gravel, and the voices of at least two children. Strangely, although I could hear the footsteps and voices for quite a long time, they didn't leave the mountain and pass by my room at all. And even though I listened to the voices for a long time, I couldn't make out what they were saying. I froze in fear and just listened to the sounds, but then at some point, they got further away and finally disappeared. Later, I told my father about what happened, and he said there used to be a building on that mountain where tuberculosis patients were kept and several people died there, including children. According to him, maybe those children came down the mountain because they missed home. It's not unusual for people or even families to speak of having a guardian that protects them, particularly through the generations. But what if that guardian was not only extremely powerful, but extremely picky as well? Find out what happens in Grandpa's Heirloom. Our 
our family got together recently, and we were talking about my grandpa, who passed away a long time, so I'd like to tell you a story about him. We come from the north of Japan. My grandpa used to say that our family followed the Kitamayabune route along the coast of Japan and then settled here. In fact, he owned a rather large plot of farmland, and he had a shed full of all sorts of old farming tools and other weird stuff, like parts of a ship and such. I was the type of kid who was more interested in playing with bugs and secret hideouts than I was playing with pretty clothes and dolls. And so, whenever I went to visit him during the Obon season, he always showed me around his shed. His piles of unknown junk looked like a mountain of treasure to me, and I always tugged on his arm and asked him all sorts of questions. One time, I asked him to tell me about our family heirloom. He went to the second floor of the shed, and then came back with a wooden box. It was beautiful, and filled with cotton, and inside that was another black box, about the size of an adult's palm. Even now, that box is still very carefully looked after. It was a rectangular box with no other decorations on it, and it was lighter than it looked. It also made a rattling sound when you shook it. I was told that I would be punished if I ever tried to open it, but even if I wanted to, there was no lid or anything on it. It was a strange box. According to Grandpa, the contents of this box were a guardian cummy from a ship. I don't know if this guardian had a proper name or not, but apparently this guardian helped our ancestors travel safely when they were trading on the Kitamayabune route, and when they tore the ships down, they placed it in a box. However, this guardian was said to be even more powerful than those protecting the other ships, and whenever it was with them, not only would the seas be calm, but the weather fine as well. My grandpa said that our ancestors were incredibly grateful to this guardian, and so each generation looked after it carefully. I don't know if it's true or not, but according to him, the Guardian's blessings continued even after they got off the ship. For example, when he was cultivating the new land he bought, he started digging randomly and happened to hit upon a gush of water. And even during terrible storms, only members of our family who were on the boat were able to sail without the boat sinking or shaking. It seemed that this Guardian bestowed blessings upon things related to the sea, or perhaps water. The following is something that directly happened to my grandpa. During the war, my grandpa was in the navy. Although he'd been in good health up until that point, suddenly he was struck down by terrible stomach pain. He didn't want to infect others if he was infectious, so he stayed behind on land while his unit went out to fight. Then, his unit was almost completely wiped out in a fierce battle with the enemy. The day after, my grandpa recovered as though he'd never been sick at all. In the end, they never found out what was wrong with him, so he could only chalk it up to the family guardian protecting him. Grandpa laughed and said they suspected him of faking his illness at the time, but in the end, he didn't die. Unlike now, I was just an innocent kid at the time, so I was like, Wow, the Guardian saved Grandpa! If the time ever came, would the family Guardian protect me too, I wondered. I was saddened to learn that the Guardian didn't like women though. Still, I didn't let this deter me, and whenever we visited Grandpa's house, I always presented a bottle of sake to the box with the family Guardian in it. Because there was a Kamidana altar, I had an image that the Kamisama equals sake, but apparently that didn't mean much to this Guardian. After I learned that the Guardian was female, I presented things that a woman might like, such as hair combs, beads, and plastic treasures. When I went to play at the beach, I put my hands together and prayed for safety, and thought as seriously as a child could about our family Guardian. 
But, well, not much ever really happened. And time passed. I visited Grandpa less as I grew up, and when he fell ill and was admitted to a large hospital, Grandma moved to live with my uncle, who lived near the hospital. And that shed was left unmanned. One summer weekend, our family went for a drive, and we decided to go and visit Grandpa. On the way there, we stopped by the house with the shed to clean it up, and I remember that the insects were oddly noisy that day, especially around the shed, and with the heat, they really started to annoy me. They must have multiplied because there were no people around, I told my family, and that was the end of that. We visited Grandpa at the hospital, had dinner with Grandma, and then it was almost time to go home. However, the next morning, I suddenly passed out with a mysterious high fever. I was perfectly fine the day before, and yet I had a fever of over 40 degrees. We went to the hospital, but they said it was probably just a summer cold. They put me on an IV drip, but it didn't help at all. Even just lying down was painful. We were supposed to take a ferry on the way back, but it was impossible in my condition, so we had to cancel it and extend our stay. That night, there was a huge earthquake. Things inside the house fell over. We had to run outside with Grandma. The hospital Grandpa was staying in lost power, and there was just chaos everywhere. The next morning, we were stunned to learn that a huge tsunami had hit the island as well. Luckily, there wasn't a lot of damage where we were, but if we had taken the ferry, as planned, then our whole family would have been in the same spot, and we quickly would have followed my grandparents. Oh, and my fever dropped immediately after the earthquake. My family said it was just a coincidence, but... I couldn't help but think that it was thanks to the family guardian. That's why I secretly told Grandpa about it when we went to see him in the hospital. And he agreed. That guardian really doesn't like women, he said. But you're a rough girl who acts just like a boy, and you always looked after her, so that's no doubt why she protected you. And when I told him about the noisy insects when we were cleaning the shed, he said that was probably a warning sound from the Guardian. Well, maybe it was just the insects realising that an earthquake was about to hit. I don't know. When we went back to the shed to clean up after the earthquake, it was barely damaged and everything was quiet. Our family Guardian was safe as well. Of course, I cleaned all the dust off the box, made another offering to her, and thanked her for her help. And so, when Grandpa passed away, I inherited the box. My family didn't really believe in it, but even now, when I set out for the ocean or a river, I make sure to put my hands together in prayer first. I also enjoy fishing, and thanks to that, I've never once had bad weather when I go out. Beware sudden calls, because for the rice dealer in this next story, it's about to change his life forever. Find out why in Rice Delivery. I heard this story from a rice dealer I know. One day around lunchtime, he got a phone call from a regular requesting a rice delivery so he decided to head out that evening. The morning had been rather empty, but apparently the evening was jam-packed. He visited this regular's house after a few stops, but even after ringing the intercom and knocking on the door, nobody answered. He figured he could come back again later, so he continued to the next customer's house. Then, after he was done with his final delivery, he returned to that regular's house and knocked on the door again. But still, there was no answer. That's odd, he thought, but the door was unlocked, so he decided to leave the rice there and then go home. But when he opened the door, what greeted him 
was the customer lying dead on the ground in front of him, stabbed several times. He quickly called the police and answered numerous questions, and because he was the first to find the body, they were, of course, suspicious of him. For the next few days, his wife had to run the shop by herself, as the police continued to hold him for questioning. And why did they suspect him so much? Well, there was a discrepancy in the regular's time of death, and when he called the shop. And a neighbour who visited the house to hand over the neighbourhood notice reported that the door was locked that same evening. But a few days later, the real culprit was caught. It was the neighbour. The neighbour's testimony had been a lie. But one strange fact remained, and that was the time the regular called the rice shop. It just didn't make sense. The regular was already dead by that time. Being falsely accused was frightening, yes, but so was the strange phone call. And for our last story this week, a tale that sums up this strange topic quite nicely. What would you do if strangers constantly kept mistaking you for someone else? Would you think they were mad? Or perhaps is it you who doesn't understand the full picture? Find out what happens in Strange People. Every few years, I get tangled up with some strange people. They're all different. Old men, old women, middle-aged guys, middle-aged women, etc, etc. The youngest looked just a little younger than my parents. And these people, they treat me like I'm their friend, and call me things like sensei. They're not making fun of me. They speak to me as if they really are my friend, or like I'm their teacher. And this morning, something decisive happened. When I got off the train, an old guy ran up to me and looked me right in the face. Dad! He screamed and then hugged me. I froze on the spot. I'm used to getting tangled up in stuff like this, but having a man who was clearly older than me call me Dad was another level of creepiness. Everyone nearby drew back in horror as well. The space around us was empty. I am not your dad, I said, and stepped away from the old guy. I told him that maybe I just looked similar, but then he got angry. Why are you pretending to be someone else? He screamed. Then he started talking so fast that I couldn't make out what he was saying. I don't know if someone called them, but a stationed attendant came over and took me and the old guy to the station office. He then asked us what was going on. According to the old guy, his father passed away more than 20 years ago. Normally, when someone dies, they lose their memories and only their soul is reincarnated. However, his father learnt a technique that would allow him to reincarnate with his memories intact, and he promised he would then visit his family and friends. At first, nobody believed him, but then stories started to pop up that various people had seen his father. So they started to wonder if maybe he had been telling the truth, and they started to believe him. And now he had finally run into me, his father. Both the stationed attendant and I were confused. The old guy was well-dressed in expensive-looking clothes and seemed to come from a respectable background with good money. And yet, he kept going on about souls and reincarnation and had decided that a man young enough to be his son was actually his father. It was the very epitome of strangeness. In the end, we agreed that I was very likely just someone else, and not his father. It had to be nothing more than a terrifying resemblance, I thought. Still, the old guy persisted, not sure that he was mistaking me. The station attendant assured him that he was. He probably just wanted us gone. 
As we left, the old guy handed me his business card with his contact details on a note on the back. Contact me if your memories come back. The company he worked for was a name anyone would know, and he was apparently a company executive there. I looked at the company website after he was gone, and the old guy's name and photo were right there on the staff list. I am so confused right now. Should I actually give him a call? A big thank you and shout out to this week's Kami Tier member, Christina. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to pick up Ghost in the Box, available on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at kowabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Kowabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on kowabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Kowabana Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks, guys. Stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koobana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koobana.net now. <laughs>